Before we get started with the lecture, um, I have created those first two assignments, the introductory forum and the um, syllabus assignment. And you all need to go in and check your grades on those because people left out a few things and uh, that would mean that you need to make some edits or revisions for me. Um, Click on your grade. As you look at the grades, if you see a zero, you need to click on it and take a look at your feedback and see if there's anything you need to correct there. These are the only two assignments that I really have opportunities for you to redo. I did have a few people, I don't know if it was in, in here, but um, they just failed to turn the assignments in altogether. So please make sure those are in. I will be dropping people. Uh, in the next day or so if you have not done those assignments. So um, that was all you had due to me other than reading. So go back and check your grades on those and see if you need to uh, do some edits as far as they go. Now there will be, um, let's see, did you all, y'all didn't have any other homework, did you? No, okay, all right, so we'll be coming up on some here. Uh, pretty quick, but the first two chapters are very introductory, so uh, we'll get to those in a minute. So we'll take a little reminder and look at those before we leave today. You guys in South Boston, if you want to pass around a roll or whatever for uh, signatures, that's fine. I can see the others. I will pass something around here for y'all to sign. <laughs> Trust everybody's got power these days. Did you lose any? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I lost mine for like an hour, but it was like at midnight or twelve thirty or something. Came back on at one thirty, so it didn't bother me too much. But we have folks that are, I think are still out. So. Yeah, we get our signature. We were out Sunday. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for some cold days. Yeah, we have a generator, so that's oh, the thing that well, can I, just go have, I don't have a generator, um, so I have to just pile the blankets on when that yeah. happens. But I don't have really good heat anyway, so I'm kind of used to the cold weather. But uh, they're calling for more this weekend. But remember, you all have Monday off for a holiday. So if it's going to snow, I want it to snow when I can get out of school. I don't want it to snow when I already got a day off, but that's okay. That's okay. All right, before I get going in this, does anybody have questions about anything so far? Anything you've run across that you... Um, how about the books? How are we doing with that? Everybody's okay? All right. All right, good, because you got to get those books and read them. All right, let me see if I can slide this. Over here, and I can do Cafe practice. 
Starbucks started in 1971. There were three partners that started the company. Um, Howard Schultz, who everyone is familiar with and associates with Starbucks, uh, came to the company in 1982. It was still a very small business at that time. He was actually a supplier to the company. And after a trip to Italy uh, in the mid 80s, he came back with a different concept for the company. He wanted to create a coffee house. And based on what he saw with the espresso coffee houses in Italy, and his vision was to, to serve drinks as opposed to just roasted coffee. So he brought out the other partners in 1987. Uh, the company went public in 1992 when we had about 120 stores. And uh, today we're over 8,000 stores in 34 different countries and only three stores a day. We have 30 million customers a week going through Starbucks. So it's become one of the most admired and recognized brands in the world. Our first store uh, was in Seattle. It's still there today. Uh, we've got the same original logo and the same feel uh, that we had back in 1971. It's called Pike Place Market. Uh, we actually serve a Pike Place blend only in that store. And so it's it's very unique. It's become kind of a, a shrine for uh, people around the world who, who know and love Starbucks. They all want to come see it, touch and feel it. If you walk into a Starbucks in Beijing or you walk into one in Kuwait City or you walk into one in St. Louis, the experience should be the same. The coffee's the same. So because of that, we create a great loyalty amongst our, our consumers. Um, in fact, the people who really love Starbucks, on average, will visit 18 times a month. So when we go through a taste coffee, which is what we're doing here, we, we leave the grounds in the coffee. So we're doing this for intensity reasons. And as it extracts and brews, it's the ground that will be bottom. So this is a very, very intense cup of coffee. Uh, this Costa Rica, for example, comes from the Tres Rios region. It's an exclusive for Starbucks. We buy all of the coffee from, uh, from this particular farm. Um, we've had an arrangement with them for 14 years. It's Ibos, an East African blend. Much lighter coffee than the, than the Davis, but it's very floral and aromatic. What I'm doing is, is atomizing the coffee across my palate. So your, your palate picks up different flavors at different points on the tongue. So in doing so, you're, you're actually coating and, and getting pulling it up into your sinus. So that's how we go through the <laughs> It's almost as bad as those blind people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We search yeah. the world for really the finest coffees, and uh, our search goes all over the world. We visit. Uh, Anywhere between 20 and 30 different countries almost every year. In fact, our buyers spend 240 days a year looking for great coffee. We buy from three different areas primarily Asia Pacific, primarily Indonesia. We buy from Central America, uh, and we buy from Africa and Arabian Peninsula. Uh, we have a group called Starbucks Coffee Trading Company, uh, it's, it's the buying group for the company. Uh, they're located in Switzerland where Almost all coffee companies are now. Today. It's become the coffee capital of the universe. Coffee grows in a band around around the world between the tropics and Capricorn and Cancer. So it actually grows in some 70 different countries. And we buy from about 20 to 25 countries right now. And we actually go back to the same farms every year. So we know the farmer, we build a relationship with that farmer. And as a result, we think we get the greatest coffees in the world of working with that farmer. It's often necessary that we also work with the government because they influence uh, the social conditions and, and you know, what the law is for that country. We don't set law, but we certainly need to stay within their laws. So we try to work where we can. Uh, frequently, when we go to Central America, I visit with the president of Guatemala and Costa Rica when I'm there, uh, just to tell them what we're doing, to ask for their help, their engagement uh, in creating um, both education programs and availability of teachers if we build schools and in rural communities that don't have them. Uh, so we're, we're quite active with the government. The coffee industry is really in, in a crisis right now. And as a result, I've never seen a situation where we've had so many coffee farmers going out of business. It's beyond just a problem for that farm, it's become a social problem. The problems have stemmed from overproduction. Brazil used to produce around 25, 30 million bags of coffee. 
And these last few years, they've had the ability to produce up to 50 pain bags. Vietnam has become a big producer. 15 years ago, they didn't produce any coffee at all. Uh, they became the fifth largest producer in the world two years ago. It's not the coffee we buy. It's, it's, it doesn't affect Starbucks, but it does affect the farmers globally. The dynamics of supply and demand have played out in a very dramatic way that's been harmful to the farmers. What we're doing and what we have done is, is come out with a buying program called Cafe Practices, which stands for Coffee and Farmer Equity Practices. We work with Conservation International and other NGOs to help create what we felt was a, a way of buying coffee that would be sustainable for the future so that the farmer could stay in business and that we're socially responsible as well as environmentally responsible. But it also involves us paying a fair price for the coffee. Uh, it involves economic transparency, which means we know and audited by a third party what the farmer has paid for the coffee so that they can stay in business. So the premium prices we're paying for allowing them to stay in business. Um, we also buy in a way that's socially responsible and by that I mean that the farmers, uh, pickers, the migrant pickers, the farmers that work on the farm, they're treated, pay a fair wage, uh, have access to hot meals, um, have access to uh, health and, and dental and care, um, and also an environmentally friendly way. We don't want uh, farmers cutting down trees to plant more. We want shade trees a lot. Uh, we want buffer zones between streams and where wastewater is used in the coffee mills. Uh, we don't want a lot of chemicals poured on. So we're very aware of what's happening in the environment. And as a result of that, these farmers not only can earn a premium price for their coffee, they can earn a premium on top of the premium price we already pay and help them make these changes we're willing to pay for them. most difficult thing for us is, is the time commitment that it takes to build a relationship with the farmer. It takes a long, long time. And there are new farmers as we continue to grow. So touching that farmer in one way or the other on a yearly basis is, uh, is something that takes a, a lot of energy, a lot of effort, but it's also very key for, for what we're doing. Um, to that end, this year we've opened our Farmer Support Center in Costa Rica. And so now we're actually on ground in producing countries. And we will have an agronomist in each country eventually in Central America. The office for the agronomist in Central America is a four-wheel drive and a laptop. So they're actually on farms, multiple farms, every single day. And that's what we want. There's a Starbucks presence there, talking to them about their growing practices, <coughs> from them, and sharing with them what are best practices. And to us, that's where the collaboration and the equity piece comes in on cafe practices. We don't like profitability or social responsibility are mutually exclusive. I think they, they can work hand in hand. That's what we're trying to demonstrate. We have an opportunity to make someone's day really great. Uh, very many people, we, we want to see them smile in the long time. Guess what day it is? Mike, 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 Mike. What day is it, Mike? Let's guess what today is. Responsibility 
and the, you know, the fact that um, their particular company has chosen to intertwine their social responsibility with their profit. So we're going to see as we look through the PowerPoints today that that is not um, always the choice for some companies, although many have um, chosen to put some aspects of social responsibility a high priority. Others are doing only what the minimum legal requirements are. So let's take a look at the PowerPoints and actually define um, social responsibility and look at some choices as managers. Share screen at the end. No. All right. Try that again. Sometimes uh, we're getting to these days where we actually see some 
social audits taking place. Um, philanthropy, fundraising, volunteering, that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that. Then we'll transition into sustainable organizations and look at ethics a little bit. So social responsibility. Uh, social responsibility is defined as the managerial obligation to take action that protects and improves the welfare of society as a whole and the interest of the organization. So clearly from that definition, you can see that it's something that managers need to do. Um, and you're combining what's right for your company with what's right for society as a whole. Now, there are lots of different areas out there. We have urban affairs, consumer affairs, volunteerism. We have legal employment practices. We have um, ecology, ecology, excuse me, I'm sorry to say ecological, ecology uh, conservation, where we're looking at the environment as well. All right, so there are two sides to this uh, topic of social responsibility. There are more and more people moving towards arguments for social responsibility, but in a minute we'll look at some people who argue against it. Uh, those who argue for social responsibilities believe that a business is just part of society, okay, the whole society. So we also have a responsibility as businesses to maintain and improve the welfare of society. They also believe that if they are socially responsible, that it will improve the profits of the company. That the consumers, the marketplace will actually view this as a positive thing for the company and therefore will uh, help generate profits for the company as well. Now, on the other side, um, arguments against social responsibility, very well-known historical economist, Milton Friedman, Friedman said that uh, being socially responsible really conflicts with the profits of the company. Okay? He said that uh, also conflicts with profit organizational objectives and that it's unethical to use the profits of a company for society's interest. That you should commingle the, prof the profits involved in a company with society's interest. Now, um, that, of course, Milton Friedman, um, as I said, he's a historical figure. So uh, his days are gone. Uh, and we're seeing more and more people uh, buy into the positive effects of social responsibility, but you can see where that came from. I mean, being social, suppose you're a company who um, has a factory that produces waste, okay? Um, profitably, you may think it's uh, better for you to just dump those waste materials into the river, okay? Uh, because it would cost you money to figure out what to do to capture those waste and not put them there. Okay, so it's not the most profitable thing. Okay, however, it is not also the most socially responsible thing. Okay, and would people actually look at your business um, with a better viewpoint if you did act socially responsible and therefore perhaps purchase from your business a little bit more. So both sides of it, okay, um, we see the for and the against. Hopefully uh, we have got to the point where we are now concluding that 
Uh, we definitely need to he adhere to all legal responsibility activities for um, our company. Okay, so now if there's a law passed that says you can't dump waste into the river, we've got to adhere to that, whether our firm believes it. we should be commingling social responsibility with profits. But on top of that, we should consider voluntarily performing social responsibility activities beyond what's just legally required. <coughs> we also need to make sure we are informing all of our stakeholders about uh, our social responsibility activities so that they are aware of them. So basically that just says if it's a legal requirement, we've got to do it. Okay? If it's something beyond that, we should consider it, okay? And we should also inform everyone of what we are doing for social responsibility. Now, legally, there's a lot of legislation out there that involves social responsibility. Um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that deals with discrimination complaints, we have the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs that make sure that uh, employers who have contracts with the federal government are offering equal opportunity for employment. Environmental Protection Agency, one of the biggies when it comes to social responsibility, that establishes the environmental standards as far as pollution goes. Consumer Product Safety Commission. All right, so that one is making sure that the consumer is protected from uh, products that can actually harm them. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, is going to regulate the safety and health standards for any kind of non-governmental workplace. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, that's um, an attempt to reduce traffic accidents by uh, keeping things up to snuff in the transportation industry. And then Mining Enforcement and Safety Administration, uh, that's dealing with the, the working conditions for people who work in mines. And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to a lot of the legislation that's out there. All right, so legally, got to follow those rules along with a lot of others. But voluntarily, um, we want managers to think about what they think their company should do ask themselves how far above the minimum they're willing to go. Develop their own philosophy with inside the company, okay? And then communicate that vision. So if you happen to be in a company with a manager who has um, a philosophy that the company needs to get involved in a lot of social responsibility activities, then that person needs to make sure that um, that's clear, clear to all the employees. So that's going to be an area where you as a manager are allowed to um, develop your own thoughts about social responsibility. Um, we are finding that this generation of workers are very socially responsible, much more so than uh, some previous generations have been. So you may be seeing, seeing a swing towards uh, management that is becoming more socially responsible as well. All right, social responsiveness, 
okay, not responsibility. We define social responsibility, but what about social responsiveness? Responsiveness, okay? This is how effective and efficient an organization is in pursuing its social responsibility, okay? How effective it is. Um, the more effective, the more efficient, then the more socially responsible an organization is said to be. So it's interesting if you're going to be working for a company, especially if you're going to be a manager, that you take a look at uh, whether social responsibility exists in the organization that you're going to be in. Um, you can look at what the obligations are of your particular company based on the business situation it's in or the impact on their stakeholders. Um, clearly, we've listed several of the stakeholders in a company here and what kind of obligations are owed to each of them. The stockholders who are the owners of the organization, you have uh, the responsibility to try to increase the value of the organization for them. They are your owners. The suppliers of materials, you want to deal with them fairly. Banks, creditors, you need to repay your debts. Government, you need to abide by the laws that are there. Employees and unions, you want to make sure you have a safe working environment. Um, you're negotiating fairly if you do have union representatives. Your consumers, you want to make sure your products are safe. Competitors, you need to be competing fairly. Make sure there's nothing that's restraining trade. And then the society at large, your local communities, you want to try not to harm the environment in which you exist. So you have a lot of responsibilities. Um, if you are a manager in a company, you have lots of responsibilities to a lot of different groups. Okay, so this just gives you a little flow chart type thing where uh, it says managers must pursue only those responsibilities their organization possesses and has a right to undertake. So just gives you a little chart to see whether you should or should not proceed with action. Uh, starting off at number one, does a social responsibility really exist in this particular case? And of course, if the answer is yes, you move on to two. If it's no, you don't have to do anything. Number two, does the firm have the right to undertake this action? Again, if it's yes, you're going to move on to number three, but if it's no, no action required. Does an assessment of all interests indicate that the action is desirable? Again, moving on through each one of these questions, if you get a yes, most of the others carry you to the no sign or a potential to actually consider uh, what kind of actions should be taken. So we know we all have, as organizations, business, business organizations, some social responsibilities, if nothing less than the legal responsibilities that are there. How do we meet those? You have to involve that social responsibility in your annual planning process. You want to take a look at comparative businesses and see what they are doing for social programs. Your owners and your stakeholders need to get reports on what you're doing with social responsibility. You can experiment with different approaches and you also don't forget that they are often very costly so you can attempt to measure the cost of those programs. Okay, so approaches where you have to choose as a manager, do you want to only do what's required by law? 
or do you want to do both profit and social obligations? Uh, what you believe in, of course, has an effect there. Uh, the belief is that these days that firms have both profit and social goals. Many firms are facing social audits now. They get audited on what their social programs are, just like they do um, audited on their financial records. <coughs> They will be monitored, they will be measured, they'll be appraised as well. Now philanthropy is dealing with monetary donations to social causes. A lot of firms will not actually actively have any other social activities other than donating money to social causes, and that's aimed to um, increase the well-being of people. I can, um, if I'm not mistaken, Walmart is one that um, follows through with this philanthropy challenge. They seem to have a lot of uh, programs and donations for um, education and other types of uh, philanthropies that are in the community. <laughs> the challenge you want to look at as a manager is called a triple bottom line. And you need to make sure that your organization is sustainable in three areas, the economy, environment, and society as a whole. Now, sustainability means increased profits, increased productivity, and increased innovation for your company. Sustainable just means something that's long-lasting, profitable. Okay, so um, if you focus on sustainability, you are looking at increasing your profits, increasing your productivity, and your innovation, all of which are going to lead to um, a better organization. So set some sustainability goals. Uh, have hire members who can help the organization become more sustainable. Reward your employees who are taking uh, measures towards sustainability goals. And track progress is sustainability. Work away. Yes, ma'am. It's working. It's working. It's working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. I can't hear whatever whoever's talking to me over there. Oh well. <laughs> I don't see anybody in Christiana. So I'm assuming nobody is there to talk to anyway. But the other rooms, I don't see anybody talk. Okay. Managers and ethics. Okay. Um, ethically, we need to focus and reflect on the values in the company. We need to determine how those values and decisions will affect everyone. And how they uh, make us choose to manage differently from day to day. Ethical management also increases productivity. Okay, it enhances your stakeholder relations and it satisfies your government regulations. Ethics is a high priority in most companies now. Many companies actually have a code of ethics or a chief ethics officer. Um, they're providing training on ethics in 
the organization for all employees. Um, they will establish ethical standards. And not only that, we do have legislative reform in the, uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which requires that managers uh, provide information about the ethical uh, actions of their company. Here's an example of a code of ethics for public supermarkets. It's actually a guide for how people should make decisions. Act with honesty and integrity. Manage financial transactions and reporting systems so that everything is properly authorized, complete, timely, accurate. Um, make sure that all the documents that are being filed with the SEC and so on are full, fair, accurate, complete, timely, not misleading. And we can see that this was something that um, really evolved out of the turn of the century businesses that did not do a very good job at this. We're talking about the Enrons of the world and the Tycos and the Worldcoms and so on. Companies that got into trouble because their ethics were not good. Okay. So ethics Social responsibility and sustainability, all three tie in together. Sometimes people say the lines are very hard to distinguish between the three. So um, they do flow into each other, although they are three very separate concepts. Uh, anybody feel like you perhaps could uh, either work for, do you work now for a company that is particularly um, ethical or particularly uh, sustainable or socially responsible? Or perhaps you know of a company that's not. This is serious stuff for a lot of companies, it really is. Serious. The company I work for, we have high uh, That's good, that's really good. Um, do y'all have a code of ethics or do you know? Um, I'm not positive. They may have it in our corporate office, but they don't have it. In a local yeah. branch. Yeah, okay. That happens a lot. Sometimes two companies are, are bad for doing things on a corporate level and then not filtering it down. But hopefully management is trickling down the information, not necessarily in the form of a report, but they're in their own behavior saying, you know, expect you to re to do this or do that. So we just got a new manager and he's like really enforcing a lot of the ethics that are uh, awesome. corporate. That's um, awesome. So yes. How about social responsibility? Are they do you anybody work for somebody that where they seem to be very concerned about the environment or the uh, fact that they're part of the community and they need to support the community and so on? I had worked at Belk and it was kind of like that. Like, they used to have like um, festivals and stuff when they had festivals in front of them. Yeah, they, they like participate that. in that. That's definitely a decision that a man <coughs> that would not necessarily have to be made to show the presence in the community by participating in things like that. That's, that's an excellent example. Some uh, businesses get really carried away. Let me. Uh, do this, I'm going to show you. I want to get rid of this. Figure out how to do it and pull up um, a company that is extremely ethical, supposedly. Company. Y'all know what we're talking about, right? Okay. All 
although I did hear that they were going above crisis for their admissions, but they got that profit. They certainly got profit in the mind. I mean, this is one of the most profitable organizations that there is. But look across the top here at the main categories that you could look at and notice that along with their investor relations and getting a career in business, they've got the environment and philanthropy up there. They are so important that they've given them tabs that are on equal basis with um, their investor relations and so on. So it's amazing how much work Walt Disney's company has done. If you look at the environment tab, you'll see drop down tabs on their impact on the environment and a conservation fund. Of course, lots of things here. Under philanthropy, you see where they give their mo money and where they volunteer. Um, if you look under the investor relations tab, you will see your typical um, annual report and so on. But uh, along with that, you can find reports on their um, sustainability and that sort of thing. Let's see if I can put this slide here. Mm -hmm. Those are more financial type reports, but if you look closely, you'll find um, other types there. Let's see. There's an or there are any compensation government Oh, code of business conducts and ethics. That's for their directors. So you can see that they are the very first sentence says they're committed to conducting business in accordance with the highest standards of business ethics and complying with laws, rules, and regulations. So they filled in both pieces there, not just the minimal legal requirements, but also uh, the ethics side of it, the highest standards of business ethics. And they talk about things like conflicts of interest, um, using corporate information, confidentiality, um, fair dealing, all of these are certainly ethical concerns. Some companies also produce um, not only an annual report with financial data, but they also produce a sustainability report or a social responsibility report as well. And we could probably find some of those as well if we dug into this a little bit. But. I just want us to see that there are many out there that um, have serious, serious thoughts about these social responsibility items that are out there. Have any questions about what social responsibility, sustainability, or uh, ethics are? All right. It's one of the topics that's still an introductory topic before we get into the four functions of management, the planning and the leading and all that sort of stuff. So um, it's just, again, kind of setting the base on Thursday we look at diversity challenges a little bit and then we'll be moving on okay we do have some homework down here i want to show that to you Do the screen again so that you can okay under uh, week two materials there is a week two homework assignment if you read that it, uh, instructions there it says complete the you and your career assignment from page 21 in your textbook under experiential exercises. Type your brief answer in a Microsoft Word document, double space, 12 point font, save the file, attach it here, and, and click submit. 
No more than one page, please, but make sure you answer all questions, okay? Now, whenever anything is on the line, you can click on it and it will take you to a link, so I'm gonna do that. That's gonna tell you that this is due Sunday by midnight, okay? It repeats the instructions, so all you're gonna do is just create yourself a Microsoft Word document, okay? Go to your textbook, Read that um, that exercise there under experiential exercises. Um, there are no right and wrong answers to this particular problem. It's asking you to give your opinion about something. Okay. However, I will be looking to make sure that you're answering all the questions and that your answers make sense. Okay. Uh, I think it's asking you a little bit about do you believe that money is a measure of success? Okay. So, um, you know, there's some ups and downs on that one, and you can give both sides, but come give me your conclusion for yourself, okay? No more than a page. <laughs> don't, don't, I don't need to be reading a whole lot of, uh, Yes, I'm not grading my weight, okay? I'm not grading my weight. Any questions about that assignment? Do Sunday by midnight, okay? Remember, nothing to Don't turn it in by midnight Sunday. Put the big text on there. Questions? All you do is once you save your file, after you type it up, just click down here that says attach files. And browse your computer and find it and click submit. And don't forget that you can always see after you click that submit button. You can look at what you submitted and make sure you did submit the right file. And it'll give you a confirmation that you did submit it. Okay, and it'll show with an exclamation point on your grade page until you uh, until I actually grade it. And then, once I grade it, you can click on your grade and get feedback. Okay. I usually get short and sweet feedback. Okay, I don't like get into it. But I will be looking for things. And after all, you got, we'll get groomed for management. So I want to see some proper grammar and, and punctuation and all that kind of stuff. So um, go back and read your stuff before you submit it. It just amazes me sometimes how many people. And let's face it, a page is not going to take you that long to read it. Unless you've waited until 11.58 on Sunday night, which happens. Okay? And if we're expecting snow again, don't be waiting until Sunday night to do it in the first place because your power might go off and, you know, get it done and over with. Okay? All right, well, I'm going to stop the sharing. I'm going to... In the meeting, if everybody is uh, good to go, remember I will post these recordings. You're welcome to go back and take a look at them. Okay. Okay. Thank you.